to have come to London from Toronto. subject of Toronto, uh, those of you who know my own ministry will know that I have spoken publicly on this subject before. And uh, when Daniel was saying that he hasn't seen this presentation before, well, I'm in the same boat because this is a completely fresh, up-to-date look at the Toronto situation. It follows on from my own previous uh, presentation, which was made uh, January a year ago. It was a talk that I gave in Randallstown, and that was videotaped. And this is really a follow-on from that. What I want to do, first of all, is I want to read a couple of short passages from the Word of God. If you have your Bible with you, I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And I want to read from verse 11. Ephesians 4, beginning at verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. And then if you turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. <coughs> 2 Timothy chapter 4 and beginning at verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead of his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Come and they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. We pray indeed that God would bless the public reading of his precious word. I should at the outset uh, warn you as you sit comfortably in your chairs that this presentation may last something in the order of two hours. So do please be patient with me uh, because there are video segments, there are audio segments, but I'll try and get through it as quickly as I can. Now, in Toronto, blessing. it is claimed by many people that since the 20th of January 1994, God has been pouring out His Spirit in a marvelous, new, refreshing way, and that this activity has been centered upon a little church in Toronto. And since that day in January 1994, what has happened is that leaders, Christian leaders and pastors from all around the world have hopped on a plane and they've gone over to Toronto, and they are being told that this blessing has a, a transferability, that you can go to Toronto, you can get it, and then you can bring it back and transfer it into the fellowship that you pastor or work amongst. 
Now the activities and the manifestations associated with this so-called blessing, they began to make an impact in Northern Ireland probably about late summer or early autumn of 1994. And I have to confess that as I examined these activities and these manifestations, and as I looked at the men and the ministries who were associated with this so-called blessing, I have to confess that I became increasingly alarmed, as did other Christians like-minded to myself. So my first uh, public uh, offering, if you like, in the Toronto debate was in November 1994, I invited uh, an English Baptist pastor called Alan Morrison, who had studied the phenomena of the so-called blessing. I invited Alan to come across to Northern Ireland in November of 94. We had four meetings. They were based in Lisburn, in Larne, in Ballymoney, and Dromore. Tremendously packed meetings. And Alan gave a faithful and a fearless biblical expose of what he and I both believed to be a terrible deception. And then, as I mentioned, in January of 1995, I gave my own public talk on the subject uh, in Randall's time, and I took three headings in relation to Toronto. I looked at the source, I looked at the symptoms, and I looked at the scourge. And that meeting was videotaped, and uh, the video has literally gone all around the world to all continents, uh, many European countries. And I and uh, the good brother and sister who are videoing tonight's meeting, they and I have received many letters from people all around the world, and this video was of genuine help to them, and it was also a genuine blessing to many people. And if you really want to know the full facts about the source of this so-called Toronto blessing, because the roots of the Toronto tree, as I call it, go much deeper than Toronto, then I would encourage you to get the video which is available on the bookstall. I want to, just at the outset, to briefly recap some of the history of the Toronto blessing for those who have not seen the other presentation. And I'll use the overhead. Cultural or political about the fact that I chose to use orange and green. They just happen to show up the differences very easily. Now what is the root source of this Toronto blessing? Well if you look at the bottom you see two names. A man called Randy Clark and another man called John Arnott. And these are two pastors now. They pastor churches in what is known as the Vineyard Movement. Or at least when they started this blessing, both their churches were in the Vineyard Movement, although there has been a change in that. But these are the two men who came together to minister in Toronto, and through their ministry, the blessing supposedly broke out. Now they claimed that they in turn had received a blessing from God prior to coming together to minister in Toronto in January of 1994. If we take the, the orange man here, John Arnott, where did he get his blessing from? Well, up here we have a man called Benny Hinn, who is well known, he has sold many books over the last few years. He's a very charismatic character. He is well known for the ability of walking across the stage, flailing his arms about, his coat about, and people bowl over, supposedly slaying the spirit. Being zapped is a word that we would use quite often. And John Arnott tried many times to get anointed by Benny Hinn, but failed to do so. It's recorded that he went to at least 50 meetings to try and get a blessing from Benny Hinn. He then, John Arnott then heard that this man, Claudio Friedzone, now Claudio Friedzone is the head of the Assemblies of God in Argentina. Now Claudio had been zapped or anointed by Benny Hinn. And when Claudio went down to Argentina, he proceeded to zap the people in his fellowship. So John Arnott and his wife and others went down to Argentina and they were able to get zapped by Claudio Friesel. So that is how John Arnott got his blessing, he believes, from God. Not directly from Benny Hinn, but through the hands of a third party, Claudio Friesel. This man in the middle, Rodney Clark Brown, John Arnott also went to him on many occasions to try and get zapped by this particular man, but nothing ever happened. So John Arnott's blessing came from Benny Hinn through Claudio Friesel. What about Randy Clark? Well, Randy Clark, as I say, he was the pastor of the St. Louis Vineyard. He heard about this man, Rodney Hart Brown, and heard that strange things were happening at the meetings that he was holding. Brown was zapping people, knocking them over. People were bursting out in uncontrollable laughter. And so Randy Clark went to this man here, 
and he got zapped. He then went to a vineyard pastor's meeting and he proceeded to zap his fellow pastors. And it was when John Arnott, who wasn't at that regional meeting, when he heard what was happening, he invited Randy Clark to come and minister in Toronto. And when these two began to minister in Toronto in January of 94, the so-called Toronto Blessing began to manifest itself. Now, Rodney Hart Brown was very much influenced by these two men on the left, Kenneth Hagen and Kenneth Copeland. Those of you who have seen my previous presentation will see this man, Kenneth Copeland, uh, zapping Rodney Hart Brown uh, about August of 1993 and commissioning him to go out and pass on his blessing. Also, Rodney Hart Brown was commissioned some years before that by Benny Hinn to go out and pass the blessing. So you can see that there is a great interlinking amongst all of these people that I have put on the screen. So, 20th of January 1994, Randy Clark and John Arnold, they were the two main men. Originally, both of the churches were in the Vineyard Fellowship. But in December of 1995, the Vineyard Fellowship decided to excommunicate John Arnott's church. This is the Toronto church where this all began to happen. And uh, John Arnott, in an official letter that he put out giving news of his expulsion, he wrote this. We were surprised at the finality of the decision. We had hoped to have some input into the process. John Arnott, he also stated this. John Wimper, that's the head of the Vineyard Movement, agrees that the Holy Spirit is moving in Toronto. It's just that he, Mr. Wimber, feels that the uh, Association of Vineyard Churches Board is not called to shepherd something outside the ministry model God has given them. So the head of the Vineyard Movement admits that he believes the Holy Spirit has been moving in Toronto, and yet he wishes to expel the Toronto Church from his own movement. I find that a very strange decision. Just in the last month, there was a, an interview in the Alpha magazine. Uh, John Arnott's picture is on the front. And it gives a little bit more information about the expulsion. It says in the course of the article, On the Vineyard Rift, Arnott feels there was a major misunderstanding and mixed signals. He added, We were put out without any sort of due process in our opinion. He has had an apology of sorts from Wimber. So we can see that it wasn't exactly a very happy divorce with the expulsion of the Toronto Church. Now, I mentioned some names that were up on the overhead in the green segment. There was a box with Kenneth Hagen and Kenneth Copeland, and then there was the orange box of Benny Hinn. And in the last video presentation that I gave, I made no hesitation in labeling the teachings of these men as being both heretical and blasphemous. And I outlined my grounds for accusing those men of teaching heresy and blasphemy. And again, I don't want to go over that ground tonight. I would simply recommend that you get the video of the first talk. But I would like to just focus upon something that Kenneth Copeland, who was a major influence in this, something that he put out just in his most recent magazine. He puts a monthly magazine out called The Believer's Voice of Victory. And in the April issue, there is a question and answer section in his magazine. And this was what someone had written to him. He says, Brother Copeland, some time ago I read an article in your magazine in which you said, Jesus didn't claim he was God, but rather claimed he walked with God and that God was in him. I'm confused. Does that mean you question the deity of Jesus? Answer, absolutely not. The deity of the Lord Jesus Christ is something that can never be questioned by any born-again believer. The deity of Jesus formed the very foundation of our faith in him. The phrasing of the statement you refer to is very important. I didn't say Jesus wasn't God. I said he didn't claim to be God when he lived on the earth. He never said he was the most high God. In fact, he told his disciples that the Father God was greater and mightier than he. John 14, verse 28. Why didn't Jesus openly proclaim himself as God? Because he hadn't come to earth as God. He had come as man. He had set aside his divine power and taken on the form of a human being with all its limitations. Since God was his father, he was not born with the sin nature of Adam, 
But in all other respects, he became a man and called himself the son of man. That's a statement by Kenneth Copeland, who was a major influence upon Rodney Clark Brown, who was a major influence in Toronto. And let me tell you something. In that question and answer section, Kenneth Copeland shows himself to be a double-minded man who, according to the book of James, chapter 1, verse 8, is unstable in all his ways. At the outset, he affirms, quote, the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. But then he goes on to state, he, that is Christ, hadn't come to earth as God. He had come as a man. He had set aside his divine power. He then goes on to comment about Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and 7, which talks about Christ humbling himself and taking upon himself the form of a servant. And this is what he says. Believers mistakenly think Jesus was able to work wonders, perform miracles, and live above sin because he had divine powers that we don't have. They don't realize that when Jesus came to earth, he voluntarily gave up that advantage, living his life here not as God, but as a man. He had no ability to perform miracles until after he was anointed by the Holy Spirit. He ministered as a man anointed by the Holy Spirit. You, as a reborn child of God, filled with the same Holy Spirit as Jesus was, have the opportunity to live as he lived on earth. He's enabled you to exchange the sinful nature of Adam for the sinless nature of God. He's given you the ability and the command to live above sin, to heal the sick, to raise the dead. He went before you as a man and opened the way. Kenneth Copeland is here putting believers in the God class. I said on my last video, there's an audio tape and he says on it about a born again believer, you don't have a God in you, you are one. The other man, Kenneth Hagen, these two men head up what's known as the Word of Faith movement. Kenneth Hagen states that every born again believer is as much an incarnation as was Jesus Christ. That's heresy. Because only someone who pre-existed can incarnate. If you and I are children of God, we are by the grace of God products of regeneration, not incarnation. Benny Hinn claims that every born again believer is a little messiah running around on earth. Copeland claims on earth that Jesus was a perfect man who received his anointing as the Christ at his baptism. Do you know who else teaches that? The Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, to substantiate his false claim that Christ never claimed to be God, Copeland quotes John 14, verse 28, My Father is greater than I. That's the very verse that the Jehovah's Witnesses try to use to prove that Jesus supposedly wasn't God. The truth is that the Lord Jesus Christ did claim to be God whilst here on earth, and I explained that on my last video. But just one example, in John 8, verse 58, when they were talking, he was talking to the Pharisees about Abraham, and they basically said, what would you know about Abraham? And he said, before Abraham was, I am. And they wanted to stone him to death because he had just appropriated to himself the name of God, the eternal I am. I am. Copeland blasphemously claims that God told him that it was a born again man who defeated Satan. And God supposedly also told Kenneth Copeland, you could have done the same. Such heresy. The Lord Jesus Christ was truly God and truly man whilst here on earth. How do I know that? Well, when the Lord Jesus Christ was being tempted, what did he say to Satan? He said, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. Worship is reserved for God alone. As a child, Christ was worshipped. The wise men fell down and worshipped him. As a man, Christ was worshipped. The blind man that the Lord healed in John chapter 9, he said to Christ, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Matthew in verse 2 speaks of a leper who came to Christ and worshipped him. Jairus, whose daughter was healed, worshipped Christ. The disciples after Christ had calmed the storm, the Bible tells us, then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him. If Christ wasn't truly God on earth, he would not have accepted worship. If he was merely a spirit-filled man, and we are in the same class as Kenneth Copeland teaches then what's to stop us receiving worship? Take, for example, Peter. He was a born-again, spirit-filled man. 
But what happened in the house of Cornelius? Acts 10, verse 25 and verse 26. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up. I myself also am a man. There was a clear distinction between Peter, a regenerate, spirit-filled man, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I tell you this because Kenneth Copeland has had a great impact upon those who have produced the Toronto Blessing. And in Money Moor in Northern Ireland, there's a so-called Bible college called the Great Commission Training Centre, and it is financed by Kenneth Copeland Ministries. I would like to know at the moment, is Christ once more God? I would like to ask Kenneth Copeland that. And if so, when did he once more reassume his deity? In fact, how in the first place did he ever set aside his deity? Because he was conceived of the Holy Ghost. And when uh, the angel was speaking of the child in the womb, it spoke of that holy thing. And there is none holy as the Lord. If you want to find out more about the ministries of Kenneth Hagin and Kenneth Copeland and Benny Hinn and others from the Word of Faith movement, I would recommend two books on the bookstore. One is called Christianity in Crisis by Hank Hanegraaff, and the other is A Different Gospel by D.R. McConnell. And these books are written by men who are Pentecostal believers. You know, there's people who think that I would be opposed to this type of thing because I would stand in the non-Pentecostal camp. That is not true. There are lovely brothers and sisters in the Lord from the Pentecostal camp who are horrified by the teachings of these men and also what has emanated from Toronto. Now to Toronto I want to come because the key figure in the Toronto experience was the man Rodney Hard Brown, who was in a center box there. Now that has been disputed by some people. I spoke last year in Newton Arts on the subject of Toronto, and the hosting pastor, he received a letter from a pastor in the town, and this is what it said. Dear pastor, I noticed that you're planning to have a meeting soon in connection with what I believe is a present gracious moving of the Holy Spirit, and is called by some the Toronto Blessing. May I mention some of our thoughts and convictions in relation to this present move? We do not believe that Take Heed, that is my ministry, represents a fair or balanced picture of what is really going on. A central argument of Take Heed is based on the opinion that Rodney Hard Brown is the source of this move and video clips aim to show him in an unfavorable light. This is not our view and we feel no connection to this ministry. In our experience, God is touching hearts in a fresh way. For some, this is accompanied by outward experiences which mainly involve weeping, laughter, or sometimes falling apart. So here you have someone disputing the argument that I would have that Rodney Hard Brown is central to the Toronto Blessing. And what I want to do is I want to show you another overhead now. It is by people who have a deep interest in Toronto and are actually involved in certain cases in the Toronto scene. They may not all fit onto the overhead, but I'll read them out to you. First of all, there's a quotation from a man called Mark Dupont. Now, he's described by the Charismatic Alpha magazine as part of the team at the airport vineyard in Toronto. In fact, Mark Dupont was in Belfast in March of last year when Toronto meetings were held in Church House in Belfast. Now, Mark Dupont, was asked by the editor of Alpha to outline the sparks that lit the flame. This is Toronto. And this is what he replied. Randy Clark, remember, he was one of the two pastors involved in it. Randy Clark was finding 1993 a hard year. A friend encouraged him to go to a Rodney Hard Brown meeting. Randy was really helped after prayer at a meeting in Tulsa. John Arnott found about Randy's experience. John contacted Randy and scheduled a series of meetings beginning the 20th of January 1994. He took a team up to Toronto and everything began to break out. So Mark Dupont confirms the involvement of Rodney Hard Brown. Then Dave Roberts himself, the editor of Alpha Magazine, he was interviewed by a man called Noel Stanton. And a question was posed by Mr. Stanton. He said to Dave Roberts, where did this current move of God start? Was it with Rodney Hard Brown? Dave Roberts' answer, it tends to all come back to him at some point. Dave Roberts, he wrote a book called The Toronto Blessing. This is the book here. And on page 13, he writes in the book, the channels that God was using included an Argentinian Pentecostal pastor named Claudio Friedzon and a South African evangelist by the name of Rodney Hard Brown. 
Guy Sherwell, he's another member of the Toronto team. He wrote a book called Catch the Fire. This is it, promoting Toronto. And in the book, he says, Randy Clark attended one of Rodney's meetings in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and lined up repeatedly to receive prayer. Five months later, at a Brown meeting, Randy attended in Lakeland, Florida. Rodney discerned a powerful anointing being released in Randy's life. The first Sunday of Randy's return saw a similar outbreak of the Spirit as he ministered. John Arnott immediately asked Randy to come to Toronto to speak and join with him to minister in January 1994. Clifford Hill, he is the editor of a charismatic magazine called Prophecy Today, and Clifford himself is a charismatic. He wrote, the Toronto phenomenon did not in fact start in Canada, but began in America last year with a South African evangelist, Rodney Hard Brown. And Terry Virgo, just the house church movement in England, he now ministers in America, and he writes what happened at his church. Many in the Columbia church have been traveling to meetings in St. Louis that have been led by Rodney Hard Brown. As a result of his remarkable ministry, scores of already charismatic people had a new encounter with God in the power of the Holy Spirit. So there we have six quotations, all confirming Rodney Howard Brown's deep involvement in this move. Now also there is a book which has been published recently called Blessing the Church. It has four co-authors, including Clifford Hill. And I want to read to you, first of all, from page four. Page four says this, all the writers of this book have been involved in leadership in the charismatic movement from the early days. So again, it underscores uh, the, uh, the truth that there are critics in the Pentecostal and non-Pentecostal camps. Peter Fenwick, one of the co-authors, this is what he wrote on pages 50 and 51. One video shows Rodney Hart Brown addressing an audience of thousands who cheer as he declares, quote, don't try to understand this. Don't you know the natural mind cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God? This is taken from 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14 and is almost a correct quotation. Paul actually says the natural man, not mind. And he is clearly referring to unregenerate man, non-Christian man. Paul goes on to talk about the Christian man and asserts that this man has the mind of Christ. Such a man is a spiritual man and is required to judge all things. What the Apostle Paul teaches is the complete opposite of what Brown is saying. And yet Christian people sit there cheering this appalling manipulation of the Word of God. I am well aware that many people in the Toronto movement are taking steps to put some distance between themselves and Rodney Hard Brown. Concerning a matter like this, that just will not do. The bypassing of your mind and your critical faculties has been carried far and wide into the Toronto Blessing Churches and has become a fundamental factor in the whole receiving process of this phenomenon. So there we have ample evidence that Rodney Howard Brown most certainly was directly involved. I want to show you uh, another overhead. It's taken from an advert that appeared in the Elam Church uh, magazine uh, back in 1994, and it was announcing a forthcoming visit of Rodney Howard Brown to England in December of 1990. Rodney Howard Brown has nothing to do with the Toronto blessing. Well, here we have the advert, Times of Refreshing, the Toronto Blessing comes to London. And uh, you see what it says here, experience the power of God with Rodney Hard Brown. So Rodney Hard Brown was under no illusions as to who the instigator uh, of the blessing was. He believed it was truly himself. In 1995, I included extensive footage of Rodney Hardbrown zapping people and uh, he was calling, causing them to fall over, to laugh uncontrollably, to shriek, to scream. We then saw him mock dumbstruck pastors. We heard him declare that this was a miraculous work of God. He said that for God to strike down a pastor it was a sign and a wonder. It was the equivalent to raising Lazarus from the dead. We saw him snigger and chuckle as he tried to read the precious word of God and we saw that those who were listening were racked with laughter as God's precious word was read. 
Amongst those on the platform party in England, whilst all this laughter was going on, whilst the Word of God was being read, was a man called Gerald Coates. Now, Gerald Coates leads a, a group known as the Pioneer Charismatic Fellowships. He's a joint founder of the March for Jesus. Uh, Mr. Coates is known to subscribe to the Evangelical Alliance Basis of Faith because his pioneer group belongs to Evangelical Alliance. And one of the uh, articles of faith of Evangelical Alliance says this, the divine inspiration of the Holy Scriptures and its consequent entire trustworthiness and supreme conduct in all matters of faith and conduct. This is what everybody has to affirm, they believe that. And so Mr. Coates has signed his agreement to that. Which is interesting because he wrote a book called Divided We Stand. And on page 82 of that book, this is what Mr. Coates wrote about scripture. He, that is Jesus, left it to imperfect men with imperfect minds to record such incidents. Which is why I believe there are discrepancies in the Gospels. So here you have a man called Gerald Coates, high up promoter of the Toronto experience, founder of March for Jesus. On the one hand, he's saying, yes, I affirm the trustworthiness of Scripture. And then on the other hand, he's saying there are discrepancies. Again, he's showing himself to be a double-minded man. Now, Mr. Coates has spoken on a number of occasions in Northern Ireland. He has been a guest speaker at the Christian Fellowship Church in Belfast. Uh, Christian Fellowship Church are staunch supporters of Toronto and also the Marches for Jesus. And more recently, Mr. Coates has been over in Lurgan, and he came at the request of three Methodist ministers who are staunch supporters of Toronto. Uh, two of the ministers are Reverend Leslie Spence and the Reverend Sean Cleland, and I think the other minister is the Reverend Moore. Now, to give you a little flavour of Rodney Hard Brown's ministry, I want to show a short segment of video. And at the start, we will see uh, Rodney interviewing an almost dumbstruck pastor. And this pastor is making a fool of himself. And he is supposedly under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And then we're going to see Rodney Howard Brown once more opening up the scriptures and starting to read. And I want you to see his reaction and also the reaction of the people who are watching him. So we will go to our first video segment. I think he's taking you for a walk. <laughs> tell, tell the folk what happened yesterday. <laughs> yesterday? <laughs> what happened yesterday? Ah. <laughs> uh... Yesterday? <laughs> All my troubles seem so far away. I, I thought you I thought you told me to forget those things that are behind. <laughs> I'm just living for today. <laughs> It's wonderful, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's holy. It's holy. Holy. Yes, it's holy. Now, a lot of folks don't understand this. They think that, you know, people make this up, but you can't make this man. How many have known this man? You know, 27 years, he had making this the past. He, he would never put this on.
I can, I can be very articulate. several other passages of scripture with with you tonight along this line we see in the book of Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse 1 it came to pass in the sixth year in the six months in the fifth day of the month as I sat in my house and the <laughs> ah. for me. That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> now, if you've never had that happen to you, it, it's real. That doesn't happen to me often. But it, it's the power of God come on you. I saw all the words. I knew what I wanted to say. But you just can't say it. It's almost like you're just engulfed in the presence of God. Now, I will say this. You can resist the Holy Ghost. You can resist it. But you wouldn't want to do that, would you? Friends, I would say anyone with even the least, the minutest biblical discernment listening to and watching Rodney Howard Brown would readily discern the deceptive, the unbiblical nature of this man's ministry. And yet the frightening thing is, and that's only a small segment that you've seen of this man in action. I have watched hours of video of this man, and I can say a lot of it is much, much worse than what you've seen. The frightening fact is that people of influence in professing Christendom, they both endorse and promote this man and his so-called ministry. Now, when he returned to England in 1995, there was a promotional leaflet put out to advertise the meetings. And uh, there were endorsements from the hosting pastors. And I want to show you an overhead which shows you the people involved. The first hosting pastor and endorser of Rodney Hart Brown's ministry was a man called Colin Dye. He's the senior pastor of the Kensington Temple. This is the Elam Church in London, which is deeply involved in the so-called Christian satellite TV program, which has started to beam in from Europe which of course is showing all the health and wealth, uh, prosperity, gospel preachers. 
And there, what you read what Colin Dye says, he says, experience the power of God in your life as he prepares his people for revival through the ministry of Rodney Hard Brown. Terry Virgo, he's a leader in New Frontiers International, well known in the House Church Charismatic Movement. Rodney Hard Brown has been uniquely used to introduce thousands of believers to a new experience of the Holy Spirit's presence, power, and love. I know of churches that have been totally transformed by exposure to his ministry. Gerald Coates, Rodney Hard Brown is a breath of fresh air. I shall be at Olympia to be refreshed. Wynne Lewis, who is the General Superintendent of the Elam Pentecostal Church. Rodney Hard Brown is a man of integrity with a fearless, uncompromising, yet exciting ministry. You are sure to be challenged, encouraged, and blessed during the December meetings at Olympia. I just want to move the overhead up. Bertie Kendall, the Senior Minister at Westminster Chapel. Rodney Hard Brown is a guileless man of God whose ministry will be a blessing to those who truly long for more of God. Rodney Hard Brown, uniquely used, a breath of fresh air, a man of integrity. God is using Rodney Hard Brown, a guileless man of God. That's the opinion of influential people in professing Christendom. I want to remind you of a report that appeared in the Christian Herald on the 14th of January 1995. It was a report of a Rodney Hard, reading, Rodney Hard Brown meeting in London. This is what the, the writer of the article said. The writer had been at the meeting. At 9.40 p.m., some people began to leave. Howard Brown turned on them. Quote, tonight is the first night religious deadheads showed up. I can smell them, he shouted. Religious people will never understand about God's presence. It's not understood with the mind. It's something grasped with the heart. Referring to their leaving as a cleansing, he shouted offensively, every living organism needs a bowel movement. That was how Rodney Howard Brown referred to the people who had the biblical discernment to get up and leave his meeting. And R.T. Kendall says that Rodney Howard Brown is a guileless man of God. I want you to listen to extracts of a letter that I received from an Australian pastor. He said this, and the letter is dated the 21st of February 1996. Dear Cecil, Rodney Hard Brown, the man at the head of the Toronto Blessing, came to Perth and held a week of meetings in the Perth Entertainment Centre, which seats several thousand people. About a dozen of us went down and handed out over 3,000 leaflets and tried to warn people of the deception and the dangers of this movement. The meetings were packed every night with thousands of charismatic streams into the building. I knew that we wouldn't make any friends through the stand that we were going to take against this movement, but the response that we received was far worse than anything I could have imagined. We had so-called charismatic Christians swearing at us, cursing us, threatening us with legal action, tearing up our leaflets in our face, and a couple of brethren even had the leaflets shoved down the front of their shirts. There were also hackers sent out to harass us each night. Some argued with us, some told us that we were blaspheming the Holy Ghost, some literally danced around us, some broke out in tongues, and others continually invited us to come into the meetings for a good laugh. I am told by those who attended Mr. Howard Brown's meetings that on the last night of his week of meetings he was not getting the response from the congregation that he had hoped for and that he began to get angry, and he apparently said that he hated those who were protesting against this great move of the Holy Ghost. Apparently he then went on to make a prophecy that God was going to deal with these pastors who stood against the Toronto Blessing as he dealt with Ananias and Sapphira, and that there was going to be deaths in the pulpit. So according to that, I will need to be very careful. This is not the first time that People have threatened those who have stood against their teachings with such things. Kenneth Hagin prophesied some years ago that pastors who opposed his teachings would also fall dead in the pulpit. Now moving on from the question of Rodney Howard Brown, a criticism that was leveled against the first talk and the first video that was produced by myself was that it didn't show any video footage of what was actually happening in Toronto. Uh, people claim that the goings-on which were shown on that first video were absolutely nothing like the goings-on at Toronto and that I had actually misrepresented Toronto. 
Well, in January of 1995, just as I was giving my presentation in Rana's town, just at the same time in Toronto, they were holding a first anniversary service to mark the, the first anniversary of the outbreak of the Toronto Blessing. And uh, I want to show extracts uh, from that anniversary service. Now, this uh, segment will probably last for about half an hour, so you can settle yourself. And the thing that I want you to remember is that what you are watching is claimed by the Toronto people and those who support the so-called Toronto Blessing. This is claimed to be a great move of God, the Holy Spirit. So do bear that in mind as you watch what we're going to show you now. Role of the audience at Toronto. Uh, there's a gentleman with a sort of goldy black speckled shirt. Uh, he's got a receding hairline and he has a moustache. I want you to look out for that man. He's a man called Ken Gott because I will be focusing in on some of his teachings later in the meeting. On the risen Lord, our Savior, we have hope, hope for the future, hope for our children. So, so we do have a reason to rejoice, for we have read the end of the book, and you are victorious.
wildfire. It's absolutely out of control. Where is Gabrielle, the lady from Germany that met me at the door? And you, Come on up, my dear, please. What you saw was powerful. And the reason it caught my attention, because my wife has seen a similar thing twice, and others also. But um, come and see here, bitte. <laughs> Will you tell the people what, um, what you were seeing? Ian, you better, yes. What's your last name, Gabriel? Trinkle, it means to drink. <laughs> <laughs> and you've been living up to your name, right? Yeah. And what city are you from? Uh, Stuttgart, near Stuttgart. Where's that, north, south, east, west? South. Last night during the worship, when we entered into singing in tongues, it sounded like one sweet voice to the Lord. And it went higher and higher. And at one point, I saw from the back, right down there, a white, brilliant white horse coming towards the front. And there was Jesus on the horse, but somehow he stopped in the middle or towards the front and didn't come further. And when I prayed, I felt the Lord is saying that the worship will become sweeter and sweeter and sweeter here in this place. And he will move forward and there will come the day in a little while when he reaches the stage. And then the horse turned round, and that moment the glory fell. And the meeting never finished. You will not know when one meeting finishes and the other starts. <laughs> you mean you think the meetings will be continuous, like it'll just flow like 24 hours? Ministering to the Lord. Well, everybody was ministering to the Lord and worshiping, and some were praying for others, and then somebody got up and gave a word or that sort of thing. <laughs> Ken, I think you better get two more revival teams ready so that we can go 24 hours a day. Wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't that be something? It's already in my heart, my dear. Fill her, fill her, fill her. Oh. Live up to your name, lady. Drink it again. <laughs> My goodness. Where is Nancy Hubbard? Nancy, are you in the meeting tonight? Um, I'm scanning. There. Can you come and tell me what happened? in the restaurant today. There she is. Where are you from, Nancy? Walla Walla, Washington. You ate supper at the, well, you tell it. <clears throat> well, hi. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, well. I'll get there. Isn't it funny how you can talk to me, but you can't talk to them? That's the strangest thing. <laughs> Who was with this lady? <laughs> a, whole, a whole bunch of you were. Where are the Washington guys? 
Yes, come on, Pastor. Tell <laughs> you better help her here. Is this one of your people? <laughs> Pardon? She's my secretary. She's what? Do you believe this, Jeremy? <laughs> you know, really, we're just up here, and I try to keep smiling like, you know, everything's okay. I haven't a clue what he's doing. Roy, what happened in the restaurant? This... <laughs> I hope that German lady wasn't with you doing those that. Well, when she and started others. laughing like that, it, it became more than a ripple. <laughs> it became a wave. And it just swept all across the restaurant. It was hitting people out in the, out in the foyer of the restaurant. Somebody was telling me that they were, there was a couple, they're probably here tonight, that they... They were, they were just coming in and they were walking across the entryway of the restaurant, I mean the entryway of the hotel and the wave hit them and they just backed up and sat down. They weren't in the restaurant. They were out in the other part, the foyer area. But the, the waitresses were snickering and the maitre d' didn't know what to do. <laughs> No. He just... He's never had a riot in his restaurant before. <laughs> but it was, it was a sweet riot. <laughs> a sweet riot. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good term, you know. We can a, use that one, Wes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a sweet riot. It was. It was awesome. No, it was cosmic. <laughs> I've never had an experience like that in a restaurant. <laughs> you know, we needed a few good restaurant stories, right? So it's been, uh, it, was, it was tremendous, John. Just tremendous. And it was, uh, you know, it, it really was a witness of the presence of the Lord. It yeah. was not totally distracting or, you know, so ridiculous. It was just, there, it was, there was a sweetness to it. That's all I can say. There was a sweetness to it. I mean, even the hotel people over at the counter where you register and stuff were standing over there, and they were just all looking and with amazement, and they were smiling. They weren't frowning. They weren't going, oh, God, what are we going to do? You know, they were just looking, and, and, and we're all sitting here thinking, well, surely they've seen this before. <laughs> But it was just waves of the presence of God, and were you all of you there in the restaurant? Well, there was there, it, it was all over the restaurant, John. I mean, it was everywhere. It was it was just everywhere. It just kept going. It Matthew was waves. Matthew was there too. Yeah, he was there. Yeah, Matthew, wondering you, what to do with his secretary. This is her his Wiz secretary. Was having to hold her on the chair. I bet you can hardly wait to go home. Well, let's have you come down here, will you? Let's have you all come down here, and we'll just bless what the Father's doing. Yeah, help him that way in. That's right.
<laughs> How many have never been to a church like this in their whole life? Let's see your hand. Fill them up. You know, Mary Audrey, I think we should, we should have you come here a second. Mary Audrey, come here a minute. Come here. Call Mary. Bring Mary here for a minute. Fill him, Lord. He said, Walla Walla means land of many waters. That's well named. I think there's streams of water, you know. You know, even I'm seeing this, I don't believe it. <laughs> now, there's something going on here. I, uh, I'm sure you figured that out, but Mary, Mary Audrey heads up our ministry team here. And for the last year, she's been the one saying, now we've got to, you know, not do the extreme behavior. We've got to keep a lid on this. We've got to, you know, and... He just flipped right out of his chair. <laughs> oh. Peter Jackson, come here a second, will you? Come on, Pete, come on. You know, honest. This is unbelievable, Wes. Unbelievable. You know, when you. <laughs> when, when you tell the Lord He could do whatever He wants to do, you don't know what you're saying, my goodness. I'm going to get out of her way here. Go on, Mary. Go on. Give it to them. night when we were in the ministry team uh, just prayers before we came down and um, it was such a spontaneous reaction as I just stood and looked at the group and all of a sudden my I don't think there's a left leg anointing but as I'm looking at the, the group for prayer my left leg just went flying up and I said more Jesus I said that about five or six of the group just went clonk and 
And I thought, oh my goodness. And I turned around and kind of with some wild abandon, I just looked at the other group and I said, more Jesus! And they went down. Uh, let's get a new release and let's go with abandon and let's forget the covering up and let's just go more! My gosh. More. Well, I don't know. I, I just want you to lay hands on four or five people. Let me have real quick Melody Green come here and 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 uh, Christina, and Jim and Ken and Connie come and stand here and Carol. Just line up across the front quickly. Do it quickly. Mary, lay hands on them and bless them. Fill them up, Lord. Fill them up. Get in there, Melody, quick. <laughs> Get in there, Carol. Lord Jesus. Tonight, there was a few of you. Are you still okay? Are you all right? <laughs> you think you walked into a madhouse or something. Well, we have had one year to acclimatize. If we had started with this, at this level, we would not have had the faith to go on. I know that as a pastor, I would have shut it down. Right, Shirley? Probably. I mean, I was a risk taker, but, you know, this is over the edge, folks. <laughs> and so, the context I put it in is this. <laughs> He's seriously going for the nations. And Wes's word was, sign up, folks, because God's building an army. What have you got here, young man? Song of Solomon 2.8. The voice of my beloved, behold, he comes, leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Behold, he stands behind our wall. He's looking through the windows, gazing through the lattice. My beloved spoke, and he said to me, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. 